Hi, I'm Don Cantor, former co-director of JLIC at Johns Hopkins University and current director at the Richmond Jewish Learning Experience in Richmond, Virginia. And I'm Alex Ozar, co-director of JLIC at Yale University, and this is the Torah JLIC podcast. JLIC supports thousands of young Jews in their college years and beyond, providing them with the nourishment they need to sustain an upward trajectory of Jewish commitment and growth as they enter the broader world. And the animating engine of that effort that has always been and will always be Talmud Torah, high-level, richly meaningful, thoughtfully creative Torah learning, ambitiously attuned to the realities of where our students are. On the Torah JLIC podcast, we hope to share some of that Torah with you. Thanks for listening. Today, we get to talk to Rabbi Eitan and Alana Phillips, who run the Dr. Mordechai D. Katz JLIC program at Tel Aviv University. Rabbi Eitan grew up in London, but has served in the IDF and been in Israel for most of the last decade. After learning at Yeshivat HaKotel, he earned a degree in Jewish history and politics at Hebrew University, a master's degree at Haifa University, and smicha from Mizrahi. Rav Eitan has also worked in high tech and as a youth director at a shul in Ranana. He has also spent a significant portion of the past year in a tank. Alana made Aliyah at age seven from New York to Efrat. She did Sherut Lumi in a home for children at risk and then was a Madrichat Midrash at Moriah while earning her BA in psychology and education at Hebrew University. Alana has also worked in high tech and as a youth director. She has an MA in educational psychology and currently works in schools in Tel Aviv as an educational psychologist. Alana has been holding down the fort at home with, her, with their three cute kids, while her husband has spent a significant portion of the past year in a tank. Welcome, Phillipses. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us Thank on. We're very privileged. Tell us a bit about your community in Tel Aviv. Sure. Our community in Tel Aviv is awesome. It's incredible. It's growing and it's new. We arrived two years ago. Uh, pretty much precisely two years ago to Tel Aviv University, Ramat Aviv. It's one of the most secular neighborhoods in Israel. And I would say it's probably the most secular university or used to be the most secular university in Israel. But we, together with OUJLIC, have created the MD Cats JLIC here at Tel Aviv University. Hopefully, and I think we can say definitely changing the face of Tel Aviv University, providing uh, a home away from home and a Jewish Torah Shabbat home away from home for hundreds of students who come from all around the world, a real international community, mainly from the US, but really we have probably 15 different languages at our Shabbat table at any given time. And so a very diverse and interesting community. That's great. I hope that one day we'll have you back on the podcast and you'll tell us what a normal year has been like at Tel Aviv University. But right now, can you tell us a bit about what your past year has been? Yeah, sure. I think we should start with Alana, right? Um, so we had everything really lined up to start the, the semester. Just two days after Simchat Torah was meant to be our first opening event, orientation, big barbecue, uh, all flyers ready and set. I, I want to say burgers and hot dogs bought already. And then Simchat Torah happens, as we all know, October 7th. And at 3 in the morning, on let's say uh, Simchat Torah, Eitan packs up a few things. He doesn't have what my parents, so he doesn't have his uniform or his Miluim bag. And uh, the most, something I never thought would happen. He goes every year to Miluim, but I just never thought they would use him. Like, he's just... He's useless. <laughs> That's what he does. He's useless. Like, what do you need from what him? What do they, they forgot how to use a tank or whatever. Like, so they took him. <laughs> Um, and that kind of just threw everything in the air. All our students that were meant to be coming, also, obviously, they were meant to be coming right after Simchat Torah. That's when the semester starts in Israel, right after Chagim, after the holidays. And they all obviously uh, canceled their flight. A lot of panic in the air. What's going to be? Um, a few weeks later, they all start on Zoom. And uh, as the semester goes on slowly, students trickle back. And Eitan spends the whole semester um, in a tank and or a good chunk of it in Aza. In Gaza, yeah. So I think that for us it was very hard that, we, you know, we have this reality that we're preparing for. We're so invested in our students and our community. It's really everything for us. And then suddenly, obviously, we have to take ourselves somewhere else. And Alana's with the kids, worrying at home, and I'm in Gaza for a bunch of months. Uh, very difficult time. It was the beginning 
of the time in Gaza. So things have changed a little bit now. People, you know, have air conditioning units and all sorts. But it, at that point, we didn't need air conditioning units. It was the winter, but at the same time, it was really just conquering the t uh, new territory, which was very difficult. And I spent many days um, and weeks in a tank without actually getting out. Um, and that had its challenges, obviously, emotionally, spiritually. Um, but it was also, um, every challenge is obviously something which is building and, 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 I grew, and I definitely can say I grew from that experience. And relating it to JLIC, I think that we tried to re retain that connection the whole way through. Zoom, Shiorim, sending out WhatsApp messages and sending WhatsApp messages eventually in Gaza. The first couple of weeks I didn't have my phone, but then I did get my phone and I was like looking for signal the whole way through Khan Yunis. And eventually here and there I, I did get signal and um, I would risk my hand yeah, while sticking I, I outside the tank. Say, I did not know that part of the story. <laughs> I was getting, I'm grateful I was getting those you know, messages was, and I had no idea you were putting your hand at risk. I was, yeah, I was meant to be fighting Hamas, but I, I really enjoy being a JLIC director. Like, I don't really enjoy uh, loading tanks and doing all that type of stuff. But either way, we got to do what you got to do, right? That's the, that, that was our, our semester. And then coming back, we've been rebuilding our community here. Most of them came only for their second semester. You know, they're international students. They come from around the world and um, resettling them into Israel, connecting them to the war experience, connecting to them to, w to what's been going on over here, and also trying to rebuild our, our individual lives, our married lives, everything. We, you know, we have to rebuild together. So that was definitely challenging, but rewarding. And I think we can look back and say, wow, what an incredible year we had. Wow. Can you, to the extent you can, can you share a little more about how you see the what the student experience was like and the communal experience, especially coming back that second semester into a very different Israel. Yeah, I, so our students, uh, may, the students at Tel Aviv University that we are that we interact with, are not necessarily so similar to the Herzliya or other communities, JLIC communities around Israel, in that most of the students are international, meaning they haven't made Aliyah. But they're coming for two years for the dual degree, which is between Tel Aviv and Columbia, or they're coming for a master's program for a year, or they're coming for a semester, or possibly even coming for three years, but they're not necessarily Aliyah students. And so that uh, puts them in a different category in that I don't think they're fully Israeli yet, and they haven't necess necessarily embraced the Israeli mindset. But on the other hand, they have a real affinity with Israel and the Jewish people, and that's why they've obviously chosen to study at Tel Aviv University. But it's treading that water, I think, between connecting them to the war, but also letting them have a calming and settling experience in Israel. You know, trying to make that home for them on the one hand, but also not letting them forget that there's something much greater than themselves going on over here, which they need to be connected to being, being in Israel. So I think... That was a challenging semester. I think also a lot of students coming back, some of them came back before second semester, and I met them at that point. Um, and they were like, the news is a little bit more scary than in reality. So like, they thought, you know, their parents were like, no, please don't go back to Israel. It's like scary there. And they had like, oh, I had enough of being home already for like at that point, nine months. And they would come and they're like, oh, everyone's sitting in cafes in Tel Aviv and it doesn't seem like a war is going on. And I think that was like surprising to them because when you watch the news, you watch the news and in reality, it's, it's a little different. Yeah, I'll just add, I think there's something very brave about our students. You know, some of them have never been to Israel before and they've thrown themselves into coming to Tel Aviv and, and it's really special to see, but it's definitely a process for them. Can you tell us about some, uh, some Torah that's guided you through the last year? Sure. There's so much, so we'll, I'll kind of jump around and Alana will jump around with me. But yeah, there's really a lot of different pieces which have been important for us. I think I'll start with the character of Shimshon, one of the judges in the book of Shoftim. And I think he is the most interesting for us, or for me, because so much of his story happened in Aza, in Gaza. And so Shimshon is really, really interesting and pertinent for our contemporary reality. And I think Perek Tetzayin of Sefer Shoftim is, is really interesting because I think the whole thing, almost the whole thing happens in Gaza. 
In fact, it starts off by saying, Vayelech Shimshon Azata, that Shimshon goes to Gaza and he sees there a prostitute and he, and he has relations with her. And from there we continue into the episode with Delilah. And for me, the character of Shimshon is obviously very complicated. He is not necessarily our classic hero. And because he's not our classic hero, I think he's easy to relate to from the perspective of a fighter in Gaza. You know, it's not all black and white and it's not all clear. And we like to think of heroism in these Disney terms. But I think that it's, it's definitely got a lot more arafel, a lot more, um, yeah, cloudiness to it or difficulty in, in, in understanding what exactly is our tafkid, what exactly is our role and how is the best way of acting. And I definitely felt that for myself when I was in Gaza. On the other hand, Shimshon has this real Mesirot Nefesh, like that his, he almost declares that my Nefesh will, will go down in Gaza and that's, that's okay with him. And this, this ability, you know, chas v'shalom, but this ability to say, I'm, I'm in it 100%, even if it takes my soul. And that's inspirational, I think. Now, what's interesting about Shimshon, I think, is that he kind of flirts with Gazan plishti culture the whole time. And I think that his story is really of someone who's interested in pleshet. He's interested in the plishtim. He hangs about in Gaza. The whole chapter with Delilah essentially happens there. And he like is kind of bringing it on himself. And there's a very powerful pasuk at the beginning of the chapter where the, the plishtim try and capture him. They don't manage. And what he does is he raises the gates of Gaza all the way to Hebron. And he takes them on his back to Hebron. Now, what is going on with that pasuk? Like, what is, what is the verse trying to tell us there? I think that Shimshon is a character who's flirting with the Plishtim. The Plishtim are almost the most advanced culture in Mesopotamia at the time. They've come from, you know, Greek islands, essentially, we know from archaeology. They've got the most advanced technology at the time. They're a real threat to the Jewish people. But on the other hand, there's something attractive about them. And Shimshon is flirting with that culture and he wants to know about it. He wants to experience that. And he wants to experience for sure it's women. But I think everything that comes with Plishti culture. But ultimately he takes the gate, what his, his mission is, being a Nazir, being a Nazarite, is taking the gates of Gaza, that Western, perhaps, you know, without being too anachronistic, that Western sensibility and bringing it all the way to Hebron, the most Jewish of cities. Um, and that's Shimshon's message, uh, um, mission. Can I take plishtim, can I take the plishti culture and mesh it or, or bring it together with my culture, with Jewish culture living on the mountains over there in Hebron and, and Hare Yehuda? Is that possible? Ultimately, it ends in tragedy. He brings down many plishtim with him, we know. But there's a beautiful pasuk at the end of the Perak, which finishes the whole episode of Shimshon, which I have to read to you because it's so pertinent. It says that after Shimshon essentially commits suicide, bringing down many Plishtim with him, that Vayodu Echav Bechol Beit Avihu, that his brothers and his, the whole household of his father went down. When, where did they go down to? They went to Gaza. Vayisu Oto, and they Vayalu Vayikbru Oto. They brought him back and buried him where he came from. Ben Sarah Ben Eshtael, the Kevin Manoach, Aviv by where his father was buried as well. And he was the judge of Israel for 20 years. Essentially what we have there is a rescue mission for, in the middle of Gaza, for Shimshon's body. Shimshon has died. Gaza is, or has been killed, died the way you want to see it. And he, as a captive, he was taken captive by the Plishtim. And he is rescued, his body is rescued in the, mi in the middle of Gaza, the enemy, t enemy territory for the Jewish people. And they rescue his body and bring it back to be buried. What an incredible pasuk to think about when we're thinking about hostages and captives and being in Gaza and the mission for why, why we're there. You know, an, an interesting dilemma came up in Gaza with some of, some of my tank mates. Are we here to win the war, whatever that looks like? You know, we can all dis discuss what that means. Or are we here to bring back the captives? Now, they might be one and the same thing, 
or they might be two very different things. But I think that this this lesson from Shimshon is that his brothers went into enemy territory where he was killed and brought back his body. And that Masur Nefesh is really part of Shimshon's story. By the way, I think that he's a Nazir precisely because of his flirting with Plishti culture. You can only flirt with Western, foreign uh, cultures from the from Torah cultures if you have something holding you back. Which is why Shimshon has to be a Nazir. Or why Hashem says that he basically has to be a Nazir. You have to have these things. And once those things are taken away, and Delilah you know, reveals his secret to the Plishtim and his hair is taken off, he's no longer able really to defeat the Plishtim or, to, uh, or they're, they're able to defeat him more accurately. Because the, being an Azir is what kept, him, what kept him Jewish, what kept his Jewish identity, what kept him belonging to his people. But once you're essentially Plishti, there's not that much difference between the two of you anymore and he's uh, able to be caught. So anyway, that's a story from, uh, from Shoftim, which I think is really beautiful and, and uh, relates to a lot of soldiers right now who uh, we should think about who are really giving everything for the Jewish people. Wow. I asked this with some trepidation. Could you tell us a little more about what you had in mind? You talked about the RFL you were sensing, experiencing in, in Gaza? That was my question. Either, either in relation to, to Shimshon or your own experience, or both. Yeah, I, I'm, I answer in trepidation because I'm, I'm, not sure the, I'm not sure in myself. I suppose that's part of the um, RFL. The answer in itself. Yeah, that's part of yeah, it's part of the article. I you know I've come back from Gaza and I've been thinking a lot about what happened. Ninety five percent of what happened was was is clear and it's just justifiable and more than justifiable. But I think there's a five percent part of me which is like, could we have done things like this? Could we have done things like that? But I really don't mean that there's like a moral critique of the IDF because I saw you know like we're not having a breaking the silence moment over here. I think it's more just warfare is murky it's really murky that's maybe the correct translation of what i was trying to say and and it's not clear cut and there are many decisions which have to be made when do you shoot and when do you not shoot i don't think there's any good answer at the end you could spend 20 years thinking philosophy and the philosophy of war and not come to an answer so how is a 22 year old soldier meant to come to that answer on the battlefield the war aims are definitely justified, and but every action has its philosophical weight behind it, and that creates that creates philosophical difficulty, especially if you're philosophically inclined, because you're always weighing up the moral. Is this the most morally pure thing to be doing right now? On the other hand, we just have to act. There are actions which have to be made for the safety of everyone, which is why I think I would make an awful officer and commander and commander because. I just have to be told clear cut this is what to do. Otherwise, I can deliberate for the next 15 years and write a few, I don't know, if I was had the money, PhDs on <laughs> what was the right thing to do here and there. But essentially, you know, we ha- uh, split second decisions have to be made. So that's what I meant by the RFL. Can you talk about how the aspect and the story that had to do with Shimshon's encounter with Plishti culture is relevant to now and what your experience was? I think it's part of the story of our war right now. I think that we can see October 7th as the start, or perhaps we can see the whole year preceding that as the start of the war. You know, when we look in in 20 years or in in 100 years, when they look back on this period in Jewish history, how will they see this this Tkufa, this period? You know, obviously October 7th will be the starting point for many historians, but some might want to start it a little bit before that. And I think that we can talk about disunity. You know, I like to say, talk about right now to my students that we, we often think of Sinat Chinam as Hashem like punishing the Jewish people. If you guys aren't, don't act nicely to each other, then you're going to be a bad boy and get a punch on the bum and get the base on Mikdash is going to be broken and it's going to be destroyed. Or you can look at it as if you guys can't create a good polity and a good civil society, then the consequence of that is destruction. It's not like a punishment, it's almost just a consequence. If you can't create a cohesive, respectful society, that leads to destruction. So what happened the year before 
October 7th is almost, it's almost inevitable that if you're going to war like that, that you'll have a war externally. And, and but I think that what's going on there is really a war with, with internally about with, with in Israeli culture. What 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 are our principles? What do we believe in? Are they Jewish? Are they democratic? Are they both? And I think that Shimshon's quest with Peleshet is exactly that. Are we just tribes on hills, Hare Yehuda Hare Shomron, or can we go to Mishor Achof? Can we go to the the plains of Tel Aviv, and can we capture that culture as well? You know, that's where the Plishtim were essentially, in the, in the, in the, between Gaza and Tel Aviv, where we are right now. And that's our story here as well, I think, that we're in Tel Aviv and we're trying to understand where does this fit with our Jewish Torah mentality, um, philosophies, thought? Where, where, where does it stim? Where does it go together? Where does it not go together? I would like to just bring a piece of Rav Kook, very like two lines from Rav Kook, which help kind of uh, give this context. He has a very beautiful piece about, you can call it pluralism, but essentially it's about understanding the good in every ideology. He says as follows, he says this in Torah that every um, idea which comes to contradict something from the Torah, we don't have to straight away disregard that or contradict it, but rather, you might have heard of this before, but we have to build the palace of Torah on top of it. I think what he means by that is that, in, you know, speaks about this at length many places, that we have to find the good in every ideology, even those ideologies which we think completely uh, contradict Torah ideology, Torah thought. And we have to build the palace of Torah on top of it. And it almost elevates our Torah, it almost elevates our thinking. So Rav Cook's talking about communism, socialism, dare I say it, fascism. Every ism there is, Rav Cook is talking about that and saying we have to build the palace of Torah on top of that. And I think that this war, Shimshon, they all come together in the aspect of that they're trying to deal with what, what can be included in, in Jewish thought and Jewish ideology, essentially, and what has to be disregarded. But at the building the palace of Torah on top of it is a beautiful analogy that I think Rav Kook gives us. And, uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Eitan, you spoke earlier with a lot of, really a lot of pathos about amidst the violence and brutality and devastation which we were dragged into and you were dragged into direct and visceral way um, and amidst the the murkiness and cloudiness in the rfl that all of that entailed there are these it was redemptive vector of use the term Messir nefesh and then you talked also about the bedrock commitment to getting the the hostages back even if it meant just getting their bodies back I uh, would love to hear you could reflect a little more the what that meant the, the experience of, of individual and communal Masir Nefesh and that that commitment and if where you you see that leading for the your fellow soldiers for Israel the community overall can you yeah <laughs> yeah help me out with that question a little bit more just pinpoint exactly but but I understand what you're talking about just trying to Another find way, a very sim- to, a much simpler to more direct way to put it is just for you to spell out just what that what that meant to you uh, the, the experience of Mr. Nefesh in those in that context the Mr. Nefesh side of it so I think that uh, just in general it comes from and I think we've seen this more and more this year from diaspora jury and from Jury in Israel, Jews in Israel, that, that there's been this idea of Mesir Nefesh and, and, and the collective, that we're not individuals. And I think that is Torah Teret Yisrael and the Ki Mitzion Tetzei Torah. That I think that the Torah of the Rav Kook helped define nicely, but that, that was already always present, was this idea of being a collective. And I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. We're not here in this world for me to earn my Olam Haba. We might be, yes, that as well. But there are other, in, in fact, maybe more important goals for us here. And that is to strengthen, to serve, to 
not just my, uh, my personal relationship with Hashem, but our collective relationship with Hashem and our goal in this world. And I think that my, my personal Masirut Nefesh and Alana's Masirut Nefesh and, and many, 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 many soldiers and Jews all around the world who were Moshe Nefesh this year for Am Yisrael is the coming to fruition of this idea that we're, we're now moving from a Galut Judaism, a Judaism of the diaspora, purely diaspora, where we focus on ourselves and our individual. And maybe I'm being reductionist over here and the richness that, that, that 2,000 years of Jewish history had to give us. But on the other hand, I think there was something there where, you know, the Ramchal speaks a lot about my journey to Olam Haba. And I'm not, you know, being, hitting on the Ramchal. I love the Derech Hashem. But at the same time, I think that there's something a little bit small-mindedness, uh, small-minded about that perspective. But it's not just about me and my journey and how many mitzvahs can I do so I get that relationship with Hashem. It's about what can I do for the club? What can I do for the collective, the collective Jewish people? And that can be from all around the world has a, has a role to play. And, and, and I was just a small piece in that puzzle. I was a small piece in that puzzle. And every volunteer is a small piece in that puzzle. But together we created something beautiful and, and, and just more inspiring. What we've achieved this year as a people is just incredible. So yeah, that's what, that's what I mean by the Masurit Nefesh. And Shimshon is a great, is a great um, well, Shimshon is, is depressed a little bit by, to, by the end of his life, it looks like. He has a good amount of you know, judging nicely, and he does a pretty good job, but then he, he seems like he's almost bringing death upon himself. So maybe that isn't our, our role model, but at the same time, I think in that peric, which I mentioned, there's a nice amount of, of idea of uh, Monsieur Nefesh, of really being able to say that it's not about me and my personal relationship with God or, or even my, my, my career or whatever it might be. It's about the Jewish people. And, and, what I, and, and what the Jewish people can give to the world, but, but, but my contribution to the Jewish people. It's really helpful and powerful. And just tying some of the ends together, you, you can tell me if, I, if I'm interpreting you correctly. If you're making this distinction between what's necessary or vital for my own internal spiritual relationship to God and then Monsieur Snevish as the commitment to the Klal and the, the, the actual Jewish human beings around me and the community around me. And part of that you know, might entail under certain conditions that you have to go into a place like Gaza, uh, or as you, you might have, it, it might have been better or ideal for your internal spiritual state to be meditating on a mountain somewhere. Sometimes you actually have to get into a tank, and as Shimshon shows, that that can involve getting your hands really dirty and putting yourself in really just complicated, difficult scenarios where there are no clear answers about how you're supposed to proceed. But because you are responsible to the Jewish people, your neighbors and friends and family, uh, somebody's got to do it, and then the question is, how do you right. figure out, how do you proceed to do it in the best, most Jewish, spiritual way possible? I'll just add that I think that I I am not a very um, macho type of person. Like I don't like this. <laughs> I don't think anyone does. Well, there, there are people that like it, but there are people that are more fitting and more um, attuned to like being a soldier. I'm really, really not that person. So I think part of my mystery at Nefesh is like taking my rabbiness and turning that into a soldier. That's mystery at Nefesh because you have to give up a part of yourself. And that's what you, and that hits nicely on what you were saying, Alex. So yeah, really there's a mystery at Nefesh from many, many Torah scholars here in Israel who are becoming soldiers when what they really like to do is learn Torah. They, they don't really like to fight. <laughs> what they really like to do is to sit in an air-conditioning Beit HaMidrash. <laughs> That's like their dream. Uh, but they're willing to be Moser Nefesh. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah. I think that Misirut Nefesh is powerful in a number of ways. And what, one of them is just the fact that there are people who are soldiers in the Jewish army who aren't your classic soldiers and who... Who, who aren't as willing or comfortable to do what they're doing and are more thoughtful about it. And those are people who are playing an important role um, in, in the war effort that, that does ensure a lot of, it's, a, it's an additional insurance policy to help make sure that we're going to, that we're, that we're going about things in the right way. You see a lot of, a lot of people like that. A lot of, my, my friend, Alicia Lowenstein, he was killed in Gaza uh, together with us. And I was with him a few hours before he was killed. But the guy just loved to learn Rambam. And that's what he did all the way through Gaza. And he, he was a geek. The guy was a geek. He was not what you think of as a soldier. Like the high-tech guy. And he was Hamoud, very, very cute. Anav, just was 
not a fighter. Or, well, it's not what Al Jazeera or, uh, or, or whatever it, it imagines to be as a you know IDF soldier. Just this cute guy who liked to learn rumba. But he was willing to give it, give, give everything. And it's really, that, his Mr. Nefesh is very, very uh, inspiring. And I just have to say, well, you know, Alana's here and, and there are so many women all around Israel who were Moser Nefesh in a very different but almost equal way, uh, looking after kids and worrying day and night. And uh, that that's really, I think the Jewish people's gvura, we've seen like their heroism has just been incredible over this war. We really have a lot to be proud of. Um, and, and I think diaspora jury as well, you know, I, I tell my students this all the time, there's, there's, there's not a, a soldier which hasn't received a letter from someone in Peru, from someone in South Africa, from someone in New Jersey. That's, that's incredible. And that, that feeling that we're together and that we're, we're being heroic together and we're standing up on campus or wherever it might be is, is awe-inspiring. And it really, is, I think the Jewish people's story this, this year is one of, of, of complete heroism, when as the year before that we can say we weren't in the best place. So we've turned things around. Ilana, did you have something you wanted to share also? Yeah, I'll shortly share about, I guess, like the comparison between what Torah I shared up till, I guess you could say October 7th, Torah I like to share and I and I learned together with students, um, and then after that. So I a big uh, passion of mine, I guess you can say, is sharing the time we're living through today. I find it completely like out of this world. Just like reading the Vua and then seeing it happen outside our window is like, I find amazing and I, I want everyone to know and, and learn that. So I, I put a lot of focus on that, that first year at JLIC. And like repeating to students and in every holiday, how like how connected it is to Israel and how we're so lucky after 2000 years that we are finally celebrating it in our own country. And then I guess you could say it was a little bit of an anti-climax when um, this war broke out and, and we, we fell into, a, you know, that horrific situation, which was like, to me, like, how do I now put it in? And we're living in the most amazing times, but this just happened. And every holiday that came up, so when Eitan was in Aza, I had like a one night, as much as I can do, but we had what, what we made sure that we didn't lose was our night learning and dinners with whatever students were around. And then there was Hanukkah through that. And and I actually just looked back at one of the messages I sent out. Sometimes I would put it in a WhatsApp, like of, of Parsha. What was it, Parsha? I think the Shalach. And, I, I, and it reminded me of what I answered, basically. So I, I was, what do, what do you say when I said, oh, we're living through such amazing times and now, and now what? Like now it's all gone? Now it's, it's, it's. And I also touched on it on Hanukkah. And how do we celebrate? That was a big question for me. It was just the beginning of Eitan's entry to Aza. Like I didn't hear from him yet. Uh, and so I was sitting with the students and I like did it. I didn't know what was going on, where he was, what's happening. And so this message of Pashat Pashalach that I sent out was when my our daughter, she's two, she was two years old at the time, finally was picked to be um, Imasha Shabbat. It's called like the mother of Shabbat in Israel. Um, and... <laughs> Most girls wait for that. Like that is the most exciting time. It was she gets finally her snack. turn, and yeah, they bring a snack. It's great, and 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 they get dressed up, and like who? What little two-year-old girl doesn't want that? And they also watch the other kids get it. So every Friday they wait for their turn, and she woke up that Friday morning, and she's like, "No, I don't want to be a Mr. Shabbat." And I was like, well, "What do you? What do you mean?" She's like, "I'm gonna be Abba Shabbat." <laughs> it's like. Wait, what? She's like, yeah, we don't like we don't have an Abba Shabbat, and like obviously that's like it was as a mother that was very emotional. And I was like thinking to myself like, what? Well, right? Like since October seventh, it's been now at that point. Um, I wrote one hundred and twelve days to the war. We didn't have an Abba Shabbat home. He hasn't been home once Shabbat, and I wrote this. I shared it with my students with a picture of her, and she obviously was Abba Shabbat at the end and convinced her and all. Um, and and I said like. Well, how do we, you know, how do we take this? And I connected it to the parsha actually of Bishalach, which I was looking back at, where the Jews have ten plagues are are taken out of out of Egypt, and then they get to the point right before the splitting of the sea, and, and they're like done. That's it. They lose faith so quick, and they're like, what do they say there? Bishvil uh, Like what? What you brought us to be buried in the desert? Like there's not enough graves in Egypt. Can you just left us there to die? Like why did you have to schlep us out all the way? all the way here. 
and they lose faith really quickly and they and they they're upset and there's so many miracles that they had the, like the, all the 10 plagues happened up to that point what what's going on how come uh so quickly and, and it when i read that looking back i was like oh wait that's me like we had an amazing you know we, we've been two for two thousand years in exile and we're finally all jews are scattered around the world and are we're brought back to israel and we created this amazing country with a strong army and an amazing economy and and the land is blossoming and everything I spoke about till now and what the Nevi'im speak about. And yeah, we had a downfall. We had a strong, hard, hard downfall of October 7th. Um, but this doesn't mean that, that this is, uh, that's it. Like the, it, it keeps going. This is the story of the Jewish people. I connected that to Hanukkah as well. You know, like the mouth where we read through together. It's like the ups and the downs and God saves us and brings us out. And, and, that's, and that's how, that's, um, that's our story. And with that being said, like we had an awful October seventh, but we we didn't. It's not this. We said it's the worst day that happened to the Jews since the Holocaust. But it, but the Holocaust didn't happen because we have our state and because we have our army and and um and that that gave me that gave me the strength to teach also and and to share this Torah with them and I guess explore that question together with the students, which is something that shook me this entire uh, that entire period. Sometimes it's hard on these podcasts yeah, I'll just add because on to I just want to just sit and process it. And I don't want to keep talking. I want like a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll just add, I recently saw someone take apart Rav Shagar's ideas on religious Zionism. Rav Shagar was not like the classic religious Zionist thinker. He had a lot of criticism of the state of Israel or, or of religious Zionism in general. He was firmly religious Zionist and he stayed that way his whole life. In fact, there's something they always say about him that he never changed his kippah struga. That was like a sign of him uh, staying firmly in that camp. But he, he had interesting things to say. And this writer um, was, was saying that he drew inspiration from Rabbi Nachman a lot. And that he had this Rabbi Nachman religious Zionism where it was almost like, that every place I go to is, I go to Eretz Yisrael. And that, <laughs> That kind of gives us a religious Zionism of we're always going to Eretz Israel, meaning we're always walking towards the promised land, the promised land, and we're always uh, aiming towards the messianic, and and that messianic is is redemptive. We're always aiming towards something greater than what we have right now, even though we're we're in Eretz Israel right now, and even though we have everything that we have, and we are still firmly religious Zionists, Alan and myself. I think that we can say we're, we're still on a journey to create something even greater than what we have. And October 7th is, and the year that happened before that, part of that story and part of that journey. And um, yeah, I, I like that a lot. Not just in the literal sense that like every step I'm taking in Israel is like a mitzvah. That's, you know, often the way we look at it. But it's, it's um, no, I'm always going to the promised land. There's always more to go. There's always more to build on. Alana, can I ask you to elaborate just a little bit more about how you view something so bad that happened in a context which is so good? Wait, I mean, so you were speaking. Sorry, I mean, you... you were speaking about how like we had like October seventh was a really terrible tragedy. It was something that was so bad that happened, but the context in which it happened, meaning we're we're in the land of Israel, we're 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 in a, we're overall in a better situation than we've ever been. Yeah. So the con like like meaning the 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 overall like the broader picture. Is a, is is a very good one, at least uh, it, at least it, it is at least for now. And uh, so, how are we supposed to? How do how, how do you view something that happens like so tragic that happens while holding on to uh, the the perspective? I mean, it's not automatic. When I started writing, or when I every time I picked up uh, anything to write in that time, it was all quite depressing. <laughs> and I think it's like thinking. Remembering what, what, where we're at, like not that it's the moment. Yes, at the same time, where we're at in historical context as the Jewish people, what we've been through, how much we've been through, and where we've gotten to, how much we have achieved, and what we've done. And I think I'm, I'm trying to remember who was this before, or after um, Alicia Lowenstein. I went to um, Eitan was in Naza. They didn't get to go to the shiva or to the funeral. I went to um, Hadass, actually it was a Friday. The wife of Alicia. The wife of Alicia Lowenstein, Eitan's friend that he mentioned before. And 
she she gave me a lot of context let's just say she a wife that has just lost her husband she has six little kids and she looked at me and i was like barely you know able to speak because i'm breaking down in front of her and she told me look at me like we he had the schut he had the schut of fighting for the jewish army something that his he he dreamt of doing and my great grandparents and alicia's great grandparents only dreamt to do such a thing because they were in Auschwitz and they would have wished to put on, you know, Sal's uniform, the, the IDF's uniform. He, he had the scoot, like she looked at it as a, this is, yes, we're in a hard time, but this, but we're doing it in a heroic way. We're able to defend ourselves, something that we weren't able to do for 2000 years. And she said to me, Tal Eitan, when you speak to him, if you get to speak to him, and to send on to all the soldiers he's with, not to be sad. They just lost a friend. Don't, don't be sad. I don't want them to be sad. They're doing the biggest mitzvah. They are fulfilling the biggest mitzvah of all, and they have the biggest schut and privilege to be doing so, and they need to do it with their heads held high and with, with happiness. You can't do a mitzvah being sad. That's what she told me, and that, I guess, is like, She's a strong woman and she's so inspiring. But um, seeing that and speaking to her and speaking to more inspiring people, you really realize the context. Yes, we're going through a hard time, but we always have hard times as Jewish, Jewish people and we're doing it in our state with our country and our IDF defending us. And, and that's... Wow. So to, to take us home, we're still many weeks out until your, your students come back. You could share your expectations, hopes, fears for the coming semester? Well, let's start with the semester starts. The semester starts with Eitan's oh, yeah? being in Milan. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, so that already, I guess, can throw us off a little bit. We really, was the hope, oh, we get to start our, this, this time we're going to start like full on, but um, Eitan is going to prob most probably be in Gaza again. Um, that's how we start the semester off. Wow. <laughs> The IDF is already planning for that, so... <laughs> the idea of um, coordinate with JLIC? Yeah. Like... They, they really try and take them into consideration. <laughs> just let them know that. Yeah. Just, I mean, they just let you know you need to buy yeah, one use... fewer burger and a hot dog. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's going to be very hard and challenging. For me, it's very difficult. I'm trying to wrap my, ha wrap my head around that. I really think the start of semester is so crucial to start on the front foot. Uh, it was hard coming back, not on the front foot last semester. Uh, I'm going in before Yom Kippur. We're meant to have 40 days in uh, in Gaza. Let's see what happens. Please God, there'll be some kind of miracle before <laughs> that, whatever that, whatever form it takes. But that, that's difficult. On the other hand, I think we're we're so ready now. I <laughs> feel a lot more ready, and we're planning for that uh, eventuality, and we know that's happening. Uh, so I have a lot of planning. Lana has a lot of planning already in the works to make sure that everything will go smoothly. And I think we're just really excited to inspire, learn with, learn from our students who, um, who are stepping into what looks like a war zone, but on the other hand, it's a land of, of opportunity, of strength, of, of incredible, incredible gvura, incredible heroism. So, so they're lucky, we're lucky to be here, we're lucky to be in Tel Aviv, in Tel Aviv University, and I think I, just a word on Tel Aviv University, I see this as like, what does Israel have to offer the world? That's what Tel Aviv University for me represents. One of the greatest, the greatest university here in Israel, the largest university, standing on the Western Front, you know, looking towards the sea, the beach. And what does, what's the best of Israel's academic, scientific creativity? What does it have to give to the world? So like, I think that combining all that together here at Tel Aviv University is really incredible and a great opportunity. Thank you both so much, both for doing this, but more for everything you've done for your students the last couple of years and for your service to Kali Israel. Thank you. We thank you guys. And thanks to everyone who's been so supportive to, to all the soldiers and to all the people. And to, thank you to our soldiers right now who are in Gaza or who are in the north doing what they're doing because uh, it's boiling. It's really hot. It's very humid. And they're, they're working hard for us. So thank you to them. Thanks for coming on.